is here to speak with us. Uh, she's from UC Santa Cruz, and she's going to be talking about eel grass ecosystems. And um, we all paddle through eel grass. We all think about the animals that we see swimming in the eel grass, especially when we're out on bioloom paddles and things like that. And Sarah's going to tell us a little bit about how climate change is affecting eel grass and also what the impacts of that are on, uh, on the ecosystem and on the food chain that, support, that eelgrass supports. And I think she might also tell us a little bit about how some of our activities might uh, impact eelgrass. So take it away, Sarah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me, guys. I'm really excited to be here. Um, like Alan said, I'm a, um, fat, a PhD student at UC Santa Cruz studying eelgrass ecosystems and impacts of climate change and other human activities on eelgrass ecosystems. Um, so today, we're going to kind of cover four main topics. A um, little background to begin with of eelgrass kind of natural history. Who here knows any fun fact about eelgrass, just to get a quick show of hands of where people are? OK, this is great. I'm glad I put that in there. Um, then we're going to talk about climate change impacts on eelgrass. Um, how juvenile oysters can interact with eelgrass and how these, how these two species can interact with each other. And then finally, we're going to wrap it up um, with a project that I'm doing up in Tamales Bay looking at how aquaculture interacts with eelgrass. So to start out, natural history. Let's see if we can, oh. So seagrass, uh, seagrass is generally our underwater flowering plants. Um, they're really different than every other type of photosynthesizing organism in the ocean. Everything else is some variation on algae, whether you're talking about phytoplankton or the giant kelp macrocystis that we know grow off our shore. Eelgrass are true flowering plants. They're angiosperms. Um, so they have underwater flowers, underwater pollen. Um, they've got true roots that absorb nutrients. So when you look at them out of the water, they look more like the grass that you would see in your garden or anywhere else. Um, like I said, they have um, pollen, that's, that's my thumb for scale, and um, those little translucent things there are uh, little grains of pollen um, that the eelgrass has. Um, they have underwater flowers, so those little spindly bits are the female reproductive parts of a, of a flower, so the, the style, stigma. So, they, oop. Oops. We skipped one. Oh, Anyways, go. so more similar to land plants than to every other thing that you would imagine in the ocean, every other algae in the ocean. Mm -hmm. They have these true roots, they've got these flowers, and they grow at really, really fast rates compared to other algae. Mm -hmm. um, they are, uh, but they're not a single um, phyletic group. Seagrass has evolved back into the ocean at multiple different time points. Um, so they're not all related, not all seagrasses are related. They're in fact um, three separate groups um, that colonized back into the ocean. So uh, seagrasses are found around the world, but they're found in really constrained coastal habitats. Um, their primary constraint is light. They have huge, rate, very high rates of photosynthesis that require a lot of light to support their, um, their physiology. So they can't grow deeper than um, where they're able to get enough light. That varies depending on where you are, whether you're in the really clear tropical waters or some of the murkier waters that we have in, in, in temperate coasts up here. They're also constrained um, on the upper kind of side of their distribution into the intertidal by obviously desiccation. They're seagrasses, they need the ocean. Um, but they can also be constrained by wave exposure. So with high wave exposure, um, the, the seeds aren't able to establish and the um, roots themselves can be torn out. Um, this is kind of depicted in this figure here. These bubbles let me see, are meant to uh, represent waves coming into shore. I don't know quite why this paper did it this way, but imagine waves rolling into shore. And the point at which a wave starts to break and make contact with the bottom is the point at which seagrasses can no longer grow. So mm -hmm. oftentimes, if it's a really high exposure area, that's what's constraining them, not necessarily their, their desiccation or lack of um, water. They're also 
Um, their habitat's also defined by other parameters, such as the sediment grain size, which you can think of as the type of soil. Is it really silty? Is it really sandy? Um, they don't want, to, they're generally found in really sandy soils, sandy and um, silty soils, not pebbly or cobbly, rocky areas. Um, you also need to have an appropriate amount of nutrients, too little nutrients and not the seagrasses can't grow. Too much nutrients can, um, for any of you who are gardeners, you know you want to get the balance of nutrients right for a given plant. So you don't want to have too much nutrients in the system either. Um, then there are more biological factors that can constrain where seagrasses grow. Um, species interactions where um, there are things like manatees and dugongs, sea turtles that graze directly on seagrass in more tropical areas. Um, there's also indirect species interactions that we call trophic cascades. Um, there's an example of this that some of you might be more aware of in the kelp forest, um, a trophic cascade in the kelp forest involving sea otters, but even within seagrass ecosystems, sea otters have been shown to play an important role in maintaining the health of the system. So I just wanted to walk through that really quickly. Um, down in Elkhorn Slough, which is closer to where I live in Santa Cruz, um, about halfway around Monterey Bay, um, there are a bunch of sea otters. And by eating large grazers, um, large mesograzers like these crabs, um, they decrease the crab population or maintain it in check at a healthy balance. Um, this then allows an increase in smaller grazers like sea hares. Some of you guys might see sea hares when you're out kayaking. They're just kind of small green slug looking things, but they're really cute, that grow on, that live on the seagrass. And these sea, with an increase of these sea hares um, and other, other small grazers like snails, um, we see a decrease in epiphytes. So that brown stuff that grows on the seagrass is a epiphytic algae. And so with an increase in these sea hares, we decrease the amount of epiphytes. And those epiphytes growing on the seagrass um, are really problematic. They're causing shading, right? They're impeding the access for the, of light for um, seagrass, which we know is one of the main things that they need. Mm -hmm. So with a decrease in epiphytes, we get kind of an increase in healthy seagrass overall. Mm -hmm. So we know that there's direct grazer interactions and these indirect trophic cascades that are really important for constraining um, the health of the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So seagrasses can come in all shapes and sizes. We have little little seagrasses that are generally found in the tropics. Um, the seagrass that we find around here most common is commonly is Zoster marina. Um, that is probably what you guys are kayaking over when you're in um, Tamales Bay or kind of wherever else you're kayaking. So it's got a much longer body plan um, and it, ha it puts out just incredibly long leaves at least up to like a, a meter maybe two yeah. sometimes. So like I said they're found a Around the world, every continent except Antarctica has some sort of seagrass on its coast. Ooh, I already said this. Here we have Zoster marina. That's kind of our main seagrass in California. There's also um, the Phyllospadix genus. You'll find them in the rocky inner tidal. Um, they're not going to be the subject of this talk today. I'm going to really focus on Zoster marina and the estuaries. Zoster marina is home to a bunch of different organisms. Um, it's home to lots of tiny invertebrate grazers, like the sea hare that we already talked about, or snails, or amphipods. All these small grazers are really important for maintaining shorebird populations. Um, the shorebirds rely on, on these grazers as a food source. Um, let's see, there we go. We also know that um, seagrasses are important to people, and one of the main ways they benefit people is that they are important for maintaining our, the populations of fish that we like to consume. Um, there was a really recent paper that just came out that showed that seagrass meadows provide habitat to one-fifth of the largest 25 um, fisheries in the world. Um, this includes things like walleye pollock, which is one of the, it's, which I believe is the largest uh, com commercial fishery by landing, so the number of pounds that they're catching. In California, um, Zoster Marina is supporting things like Dungeness crab populations. You see Dungeness crab moving in and around seagrass, especially when they're juveniles, um, and Pacific herring as well. So that's kind of it for a quick eelgrass natural history background, um, and we are going to move on to um, understanding how climate change will impact eelgrass and eelgrass ecosystems. So the title of this kind of section is Unexpected Resilience of a Seagrass System Exposed to Global Stressors. 
And our main question with this project that we, I did a couple years ago with my lab was to understand how seagrass ecosystems will respond to ocean acidification or to the addition of carbon dioxide into the water. Um, we think, can think of, again about direct and indirect effects. We can think that directly having more carbon dioxide in the water might be beneficial for seagrasses. Seagrasses, as with any other plant or even algae, rely on having carbon dioxide available to them for photosynthesis. So having an increase in carbon dioxide in the water could be really beneficial to seagrass. It's like having an almost like a nutrient subsidy. It's a you know it's a, something that they really need to survive and having a greater amount of it could be really beneficial to them. This has been shown for lots of land plants as well, that land plants can respond beneficially to having um, carbon, increased carbon dioxide under certain conditions. But there, we're less clear on what some of the indirect effects might be. We kind of already talked about <coughs> how there's algal species, epiphytic algae that can land on the seagrass. And we know that algae similarly would respond well to having increased carbon dioxide. They might grow better with that. Mm -hmm. So there could be direct competition with them. Um, however, we might have um, benefits of these grazers. Similar when we were talking about the trophic cascade, the grazers might be able to control the epiphytic algae by increasing their consumption of this algae and then allowing the seagrass to continue to thrive. So what we did is we set up what we call an experimental mesocosm system. So in the first photo, we've got these big blue 55 gallon barrels where we planted seagrass shoots and added in um, a suite of little grazers, including those green sea hares, the Taylor sea hares. And the system, it's a little bit complicated, but um, what we do basically is add um, CO2, so just like a big tank of CO2 gas, we bubble it into a header tank to decrease the pH of that water. We then mix that low pH water with fresh seawater, FSW, and um, control that mixture to create a range of different um, pH values where we are adding, um, where we are growing the seagrass. We also um, modified whether they were receiving just normal levels of nutrient, nutrients from the soil or an increased level of nutrients by adding little nutrient pellets, similarly to what you might add to your lawn. We kind of buried those into the sand. So we wanted to understand how the seagrass and the grazers and the epiphytes will all respond to these different levels of pH as well as to different levels of nutrients. I'm going to focus a little bit more today on the um, levels of pH. So like all good scientists, we're really driven by hypotheses and as we're asking our research questions. So this figure kind of outlines our hypotheses generally. I want to kind of walk you guys through it a little bit because it's a lot of slides all at once. Um, so our first hypothesis was that all, that the seagrass and the epiphytes and the grazers would all kind of function independently. So you would expect that if you are a sea hare and you have access to greater um, food resources, you would probably eat more food resources, but only up to a certain point. You know, everybody gets sa sa satiated. And then at that point, you might, um, you might decrease the, the rate that you're consuming. Um, for epiphytes, we said that the acidification of the seawater would increase their growth um, when kind of independently of any other indirect er, interactions. So our hypothesis is that if this is an independent function, the acidification of the seawater will just increase their growth. Um, same thing for seagrass. We expected that the acidification of the seawater would increase their growth. Our second hypothesis is that is kind of involving this concept of species interactions that we might not see just independent functions, but rather that these, the functional responses of these different organisms might depend on each other. So within this, this, first, this second hypothesis, we had the same kind of functional shape response for sea hares, expecting that if you increase um, the same, same idea, that eventually, even though sea, sea hares will increase the amount that they eat, they get satiated and they have to decrease their, increase, their uh, consumption rate. Um, we expected that um, 
the epiphytes, because they grow so rapidly, we would expect to see a, a similarly increasing rate of growth, but that the seagrasses would be dependent on the functional shape of the, of the sea hares. So that as the sea hares stop eating as much of the epiphyte, epiphytic growth, the seagrass would in turn grow less because it's being swamped out by the epiphytic growth. It's being shaded too much. It's not being allowed to grow. So what we found is that um, we are really seeing the importance of species interactions in this system. Um, we saw that sea hares overall um, follow that same um, curve that we predicted where they increase their uh, consumption rate and then are eventually satiated. Um, that macroalgal or the epiphy epiphytic algae um, generally increase their growth rate regardless of the, um, of the pH of the water. And that, but that seagrass shoots have a similar, it's not quite as pretty as our, in our hypothesis slide, but have a similar functional response where they have more of a curve. And as the um, sea, sea hares increase their consumption and then decrease it, the sea grasses respond similarly, increasing their growth, but declining in growth um, as they're eventually kind of taken over by the epiphytic algae. So this was, this was what was really surprising for us and what drove home that um, while we see some level of resilience in the system, um, it's really important to understand the indirect effects of, um, of the interactions between the species. Um, so people tend to talk about winners and losers of climate change, but there's lots of different ways that you can kind of parse that out. You can have direct, uh, you can think about the direct physiological impacts of climate change, but it's really important to understand the interactions between species. So that is our climate change impacts on eelgrass ecosystems and the importance of understanding species interactions. Um, the next uh, project I want to talk about is looking at the interactions between juvenile oysters and eelgrass ecosystems. So this work was done in Tamales Bay, and we were trying to understand whether seagrass can provide a beneficial habitat to juvenile oysters, particularly under future climate conditions, thinking about low pH waters. Um, so what we know about ocean acidification is that as the pH of the ocean decreases, the animals that are most impacted are those with calcium carbonate shells. It makes it much harder for them to build their shells. And what we're trying to understand is whether um, thinking about these organisms, not in isolation, but in how they interact with the habitat um, around them, including seagrasses, um, whether that might be able to provide some amelioration to the stress that they feel from ocean acidification. So today I'm focusing on seagrasses and oysters. Um, we're focusing on oysters because we know that ocean acidification is already a threat to oysters. Um, we've seen a large losses um, within the oyster aquaculture business. Um, particularly, there was a hatchery up in um, Oregon called Whiskey Creek Hatchery, and they suffered enormous losses when they had an upwelling of really low pH water enter their hatchery system. It just wiped out an enormous amount of their um, tiny juvenile oysters. And they, they provide, uh, I can't remember the exact number, but it's, it's an enormous amount. Well, I want to say 80% of the hatchery spat to um, farmers across the West Coast. So generally, um, people don't grow their own baby oysters. They get baby oysters from a hatchery and then farm them out themselves as an aquaculture farmer. So it's really important to understand how, uh, how oysters can respond to, um, to low pH waters and then whether there's anything we can do to ameliorate the impacts. So we know that increasing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere um, leads to an increase of carbon dioxide dissolving <coughs> into the ocean. And that carbon dioxide um, will interact with water and form carbonic acid. Um, this carbonic acid disassociates into bicarbonate and uh, hydrogen ions. And this overall decreases the pH of the water. Um, the hydrogen ions can then interact with the car with carbonate ions that exist naturally in the water. And this is what really harms um, organisms that build shells. They make calcium carbonate shells. So if hydrogen ions are bonding with carbonate, 
there's less available for them to build their shells. When we're thinking about how seagrass can interact with this, um, seagrass, we know, takes up carbon dioxide and by doing so might reverse kind of the direction of the chemical balance of the system. Sorry guys, thanks for uh, interrupting. Oh, then a question while she's fiddling with that. Uh, you didn't mention uh, most any of the terms uh, can't live in salt water. No, yeah. So uh, uh, there are very, very many plant, uh, land based plants that have evolved to do this. How do uh, these survive in this is a pretty high salinity environment? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's lots of plants that live in lakes, you know, freshwater plants, but it's a limited number of plants that live in the ocean. Um, there's a few different challenges that they're dealing with. Um, one is um, just having water around you as the fluid that you're involved in, not air. Um, they have modified the way that they take up carbon dioxide from the water. Um, it's a much more complicated process than it is with land plants. With land plants, they've got um, pores within their leaves where carbon dioxide is able to enter kind of through diffusion. Um, with seagrasses, they have a series of chemical reactions in which they bind carbon dioxide to different proteins on the leaf surface and are able to bring it into the leaf through that mechanism. But that's just water in general. What about the, uh, the salinity? That, I, to be honest, I don't have as clear of an understanding on it. I'm not sure if it's known exactly how they tolerate that. I know that they, they um, modify the salinity within um, their leaf tissues as a way, as a response to that. A lot of seagrasses grow across a really wide salinity gradient. So you can have um, seagrasses in estuaries that grow um, near where the freshwater source in the estuary is and the salinity is down in the 20s or upper teens and they're, they're doing fine and that same species can be at the mouth of the mm -hmm. estuary where the um, salinity is thir you know, 33, it's ocean salinity and they are also looking really happy. Mm -hmm. um, so they can span a pretty wide range of, of environmental variables. That doesn't quite answer your question but <laughs> um, that, is, that is what I know on the subject. Okay, how's how is that? Is that good? Okay. You're, you're fine without it. Yeah, we can hear you fine without the mic. Or can you? Can, can, ever, can anyone not hear me without the mic? It's better, it's better with the mic? Okay. Okay, I will try to do my best. I'm not great with the, <laughs> the microphone. Okay, I will try to lock it in. Okay. Um, so let's see, we were talking about oysters, we were talking about carbon dioxide, carbonic acid, and the impacts that this has on shell building processes. But when you add a photosynthesizer like seagrass, particularly seagrass because it has these really incredibly high rates of photosynthesis, um, it can shift the chemical balance of the water, um, causing, by drawing down CO2, causing less formation of carbonic acid. And um, this is beneficial for the oysters. There's more um, carbonate available for them to build their calcium carbonate shells. So to anthropomorphize, it's a win-win. The oysters are happy, the seagrass is happy. Um, that's the idea. And it's actually an idea that has really um, taken hold at the state legislature level. People really, man resource managers are really looking for a solution how do we address this, you know, the, all the problems of climate change, but this aspect of climate change, ocean acidification, how do we protect our coasts from this global problem? And this could be a local solution. Could we, could we you know, increase the abundance of seagrasses as a way to locally ameliorate the effects of climate change and ocean acidification? It's an interesting idea. So what we wanted to do was um, test how juvenile oysters, which we know are affected by ocean acidification, how they respond to being placed inside and outside of seagrass. So we did this in Tomales Bay. This is my very crude, this is the level of my artistic skills right here, uh, which is why I'm a scientist. And we put juvenile oysters across a seagrass density gradient, we called it. So we have juvenile oysters in the middle of the seagrass bed, 
towards the edge, right on the edge, and then within the mud flat and even further away from the seagrass in the mud flat. And so we wanted to look at the growth response of the juvenile oysters over the three week period with which they were deployed. So our hypothesis based on our understanding of how seagrasses can um, locally increase the pH and how this might be beneficial for oysters is that wow. the oysters are gonna love it. That's our hypothesis. The oysters are gonna grow way better in the seagrass. Science is fun though, so what we found was something along Ooh. this line. <laughs> uh, if you had to plot a line through it, that would be your line, but that really isn't actually the best line. It's more of a categorical response. If you are an oyster inside the seagrass at all, you do not grow as well as if you're an oyster towards the edge or away from the seagrass, which is kind of interesting. Um, and yeah, makes my job interesting. So kind of our next steps with this, this is an ongoing project, is to think about why. Why are we seeing this response? Um, there could be physical reasons. Um, we, we had put out sensors that measure the pH, dissolved oxygen, temperature, salinity, and water flow. Um, there could be biological reasons. We also had sensors that measured the chlorophyll A concentration of the water, and chlorophyll A we're using as a proxy for phytoplankton concentration, so what the baby oysters are using for their food. Um, and then we're also going to repeat this experiment in different seasons and different locations to try and understand, was this a one-off result? Is this just generally the pattern that we see? Does it vary with the time of year and with where you are and the conditions of that area? I think it's most likely driven by water flow because seagrasses uh, do slow down the flow of water as it's moving. Um, you've probably seen this when you're kayaking. Um, mm -hmm. And because of that, there's just less water moving past these filter feeding oysters and they're just maybe not getting as much food. What is interesting about this though, is that my, um, ooh, let me see, oh, sorry. I got a little bit ahead of myself. Um, so our future direction with this would actually be to um, flip the species interaction rather than looking at how seagrass can impact um, juvenile oysters, look at how adult oysters, which are um, consuming and filtering large, large quantities of water, um, how they might be able to uh, impact seagrass beds, potentially increasing the light <coughs> conditions within the water. This is an ongoing project and, had, and has a huge number of people involved in it, so I just wanted to throw up a real quick acknowledgement slide for all the people who have helped with field work and with lab work. Um, so that is, what are we on? Part three, juvenile oysters and eelgrass. And we're transitioning over to uh, the fourth part of my talk, which is understanding the interactions between oyster aquaculture and eelgrass. Um, and we're both looking at we're both looking at the interactions between these two species and also trying to test out new ways of monitoring eelgrass, um, which include flying drones. Um, this project came out of, this, of the previous project that I was speaking about, understanding the impacts of um, uh, eelgrass on juvenile oysters. Uh, we started looking around at kind of some of the oyster aquaculture that was happening in Tomales Bay and um, wanted to get a better understanding of how oyster aquaculture impacts seagrass ecosystems and whether there's any potential that it could be beneficial to seagrass ecosystems. Um, this is a collaborative project between UC, myself at UC Santa Cruz and the Nature Conservancy and Hog Island Oyster Company based up in Tomales Bay. So we've already talked about seagrass ecosystems, how they house an enormous number of um, species. They're very commercial. They're important for um, commercially important fish species. And um, this importance as an ecosystem is recognized at kind of the um, federal level. Um, they're designated an essential fish habitat under the Magnuson-Stevens Fisheries Act. And so they cannot be harmed um, under this federal protection. They're also protected at the state level. California has a policy called the California Eelgrass Mitigation Policy that defines um, how anybody who has to do any type of activities or disturbance within the coast um, has to uh, mitigate the impacts of their activity. 
um, and make sure that there is no net loss of habitat function is how they define it. So they don't want a net, a net decrease in the acres of habitat that the eel grass can provide. So this project takes place up in Tamales Bay. Um, you guys probably have a good sense where Tamales Bay is, but just north of here. Um, and what we're, what the areas that we're looking at are um, uh, areas where we have aquaculture activity. So these are plastic um, mesh bags filled with oysters plopped up on racks, and they are in the mudflat area of the intertidal zone. And directly adjacent to them, I think you guys can maybe see, there's these green blobs. These are patches of seagrass, and there's a big seagrass bed that is right here. And they're directly adjacent to each other. Again, the oyster companies, anybody who's doing anything in the coastal zone cannot harm seagrass, so they're very constrained where they can put their, um, their gear. And it's, they follow the rules because the fines are very, very steep. Um, but they are right adjacent to each other. So just to zoom in a little bit, um, again, I'm working with Hog Island Oyster Company. And they, they have these mesh bags that are propped up two to three feet off the bottom. Um, and this is generally thought to be in the aquaculture industry, which I'm getting to learn a lot about. Um, to be a low impact, environmentally friendly method because in the old days you used to kind of throw your oysters directly in the mud flat, suck them up with a big hydraulic vacuum. It's easy to imagine how that could create a lot of disturbance. You're going to increase the sediment in the water column, which decreases the light that the seagrasses need. Um, and in this way, things are propped up off the bottom, then there's more potential for light and less potential for direct damage to the mud flat area. Um, these guys are growing um, your typical oysters on the half shell type of oyster. Um, and they're all shoved into a bag like this. Um, they, they're ordered from a hatchery like Whiskey, Whiskey Creek Hatchery. And then they are grown out until they reach market size. So what, they, what this company and what a few other companies have shared with me is that they have seen um, instances where they'll find eelgrass in between their racks of gear. Um, so this is one set of racks, and there's another set of racks just just here, just outside of the picture. And they have they've seen eelgrass grow in the areas in between their gear, um, and they're curious to see whether this is a trend, whether eelgrass is actively growing towards the gear, um, or whether this is just an anomalous event that they observed. Eelgrass is a living plant. It can grow in all sorts of different directions. It can respond to different climate conditions. This could just be a plant doing what a plant does. It could have nothing to do with oyster aquaculture. Or it could. If it is driven by oyster aquaculture, some possible mechanisms um, based on what we know about the habitat and what eelgrass needs, um, we could have a decrease of water motion up at the upper edge of their distribution at the higher intertidal. Um, we had kind of already talked about that wave exposure can decrease um, their ability to grow at higher, um, higher in the inner tidal. Um, they might be similarly stabilizing the sediments up there with the um, gear. Um, these oysters could be filtering the water to such an extent that it increases water clarity. Um, and they could also be increasing um, the nutrients in the water column. Oh, so just to highlight this, the first two are wave exposure. And the, sec and the third one is kind of filtration of, wa of the water and light availability. Um, we are interested in understanding um, and, and the effects of aquaculture because California is an enormous um, aquaculture consuming state. We consume a lot of shellfish, but we get a lot of our shellfish from outside of the state because there are such constraints on where aquaculture can be grown. I'm generally very happy about this. I want you know seagrasses and other native ecosystems to be grown well, um, but there uh, is a is kind of a need for a better understanding of how um, aquaculture can affect seagrass at a broader landscape level um, and what this can mean for the ecosystem. We're looking for potential win-win solutions. It's possible that we could ha have an increase in aquaculture growth while also having benefits to seagrass. That would be great. I would love to see anything that has benefits to seagrass. 
Um, so our research questions are first, what are the impacts of aquaculture to eelgrass in Tomales Bay? And second, can we develop a drone-based methodology to uh, monitor how eelgrass and aquaculture interact with each other? Um, so just diving into the first one. Uh, my, my hypothesis, given the observations of um, these aquaculture companies, is that seagrass will grow towards um, the uh, aquaculture gear. And that's, I think that's primarily driven by this decrease in wave exposure at that upper limit, that they're just able to capitalize on a smaller, a small bit of habitat that wasn't previously accessible to them because of too much wave exposure. Um, so I'm working at sites across Tomales Bay so that we can capture a range of environmental conditions to see whether um, we have uh, similar responses within eelgrass ecosystems towards the mouth of the bay, those high salinity areas, or towards the back of the bay, lower salinity areas. And my experimental design for this study is called a Baki design, before or after control impact. And just kind of to walk you through what that looks like, we select two sites and designate one as our control site where we're not going to do anything to it, and one is our impact site. And we do a series of surveys um, with transects and quadrats. So I did surveys in the seagrass to understand kind of the natural state of the seagrass bed, how many shoots are there naturally, how tall are these shoots, what's the percent cover of the shoots, and then also um, surveys in the mudflat just to show that there isn't any seagrass there at that point. And I did those surveys for over a year. Um, so that looks like going out scuba diving in a really ridiculously small amount of water, like this much water, um, and having a quadrat where you're kind of laying it down a standardized area and counting um, the number of shoots in there and taking some measurements. And then um, after over a year, we came back and we installed aquaculture gear. Those represent the racken bags um, that you guys have seen before, even though I'm a, not a great artist. Um, and we, so we installed those, um, those gear, that gear. Oh, that was supposed to be a video. Not quite. Anyways, little video just showing that we install um, first plastic pipes, and then we put the, um, the mesh plastic um, bags with the oysters on top of them. So in addition to doing the transect and quadrats to understand how the seagrass responds, we really want to know how the ecosystem responds as well. Um, so I have been uh, looking at how the invertebrate community is changing. Um, so I take uh, little cores and I get sediment cores and then pick out all the little invertebrates that live within the sediment. Um, I also do some collections for the epifaunal community, the community that lives on the seagrass and on the surface of the sediment. And then I also put out crab traps and larger traps to try and capture um, bigger, bigger crabs and things and then also the fish community as well. We also want to understand what might be driving any changes that we might see. So I've put out sensors to measure um, the light and do collections to get at the grain size of the sediments and collect water nutrient and water flow information as well. So we are in currently, this is an ongoing project, so we're currently monitoring for the short-term impacts of the gear installation. We just installed the gear recently and are also going to do these, these monthly seagrass surveys and try to understand how um, the community, survey, the community um, changes each year following um, the gear installation. So stay tuned, that's, that's what's next. Um, so that's our first question. Our second question was looking at whether there is perhaps a better, more efficient way to survey these eelgrass ecosystems besides me getting in the water mm -hmm. as a diver and counting shoots which I love to do, it's my favorite part of my job, but we can only cover so much of an area. You know, it's expensive to put divers in the water, you have to tow up a boat and you have to have, I can't just dive alone, I have to bring a dive buddy because of safety and just all sorts of things that you have to take into account. Um, drones these days are more, let's see, Ooh, sorry. Drones are uh, getting to the point where they are accessible price-wise. Um, I have a drone that I use for this project that was uh, $2,000, maybe $3,000 when you add in a couple of add-ons, which is not cheap, um, but it's ex an accessible price that might, with that one-time investment, be 
worth it and more um, economical than putting people into the water. Um, so these, the benefits of these drones is they can cover an enormous area. Um, you can get, um, you can upload these photos really quickly and have, once you have kind of your process in place, you can have a really high resolution image of your site very quickly. And um, you want, you'll of course want to be able to do some ground truthing with scuba surveys, but once you have a handle on um, what the images look like and understand um, what features you're looking for, you might be able to do repeat surveys without any scuba surveys. So just to show you kind of a quick drone photo, this is the same site that I showed initially on that slide showing that aquaculture is adjacent to eelgrass. So you can pick out eelgrass, um, you can pick out oyster racks, um, you can pick out different floats, um, different features. Um, one thing that we're finding challenging is being able to distinguish between um, eelgrass and uh, a large macroalgae species called ulva. You guys have maybe encountered ulva before. Um, ulva, I, I know because I was on the ground, this is ulva and this is eelgrass. Here, they're slightly different in color, but it's, it's not uh, readily distinguishable, particularly when the tide comes in, it's much harder to distinguish them. So we're working on understanding how we can use um, different types of spectral cameras to be able to distinguish those features. But what is interesting is that we can um, go back in time and look at kind of Google Earth images and compare how seagrass has changed over time. This is an image from March 2010, March 2015, and then whoop, layering on the image that we took in May of 2017 and then seeing kind of how seagrass varies with time. And obviously we didn't capture the full extent of the seagrass bed, but it does allow you to compare the surveys you're doing currently with um, existing historical data that, um, that is you know, archived online and elsewhere. Um, so just to show you kind of some uh, how I'm using this data, I fly my drone over a large area. I get these really high resolution images where I can zoom in on um, the aquaculture gear that I just installed um, recently and be able to zoom in even further. And um, this is my assistants helping me um, do some surveys in the mud flats and be able to outline where the eelgrass is in relation to where the aquaculture gear is. So our next steps for this are to continue testing um, how these images come out under different tidal conditions, sunlight angles, wind conditions, um, the drones aren't waterproof, so we're constrained in when we can fly these drones. Um, anytime there's a lot of fog or mist, you're not able to fly your drone. Um, we also want to um, look at how well we can account for different um, parameters in measuring the seagrass. So how well can we look at the extent of the bed and the percent cover of the bed? So how much of the bed, the total bed is seagrass versus having patches of mudfly in it? And then also the shoot density. Um, these are all parameters that the California eelgrass mitigation policy um, really is hoping that people are able to collect information on to show that they either did or didn't damage a seagrass bed. So these would be important tools for resource managers to be able to, um, or it'd be important to have to be able to collect information on these types of parameters. And we also want to be able to track change. We want to get historical comparisons and understand um, the the level of variability that exists naturally within these seagrass beds. So take home messages for this section. Um, we're testing impacts of aquaculture on eelgrass bed and developing these drone based methodologies in order to be able to monitor more efficiently. Um, so I want to just wrap up by saying thank you for listening. We um, have covered natural history of eelgrass thinking about the importance of understanding complex species interactions and understanding how eelgrass and the communities will respond to climate change, um, looking at the interactions between juvenile oysters and eelgrass and realizing that it's not always as simple as um, looking at the first hypothesis. You kind of end up with some surprise hypotheses. And then we wanted, uh, then the last bit was just understanding how aquaculture and eelgrass can interact together. So with that, I just wanted to say thank you, and um, I can take any questions if you have them.
So I know that right now they are studying, they're in the process of studying that. Um, they're doing in the water diver surveys. Um, they have go kind of, their, their way that they do is they have GoPros attached to um, kind of a, a scaffolding that they swim with and then they go back and do video analysis as they swim over the transect. Um, there's also a team that is working on understanding whether they can use, um, use drone footage in that area as well. Um, so they flew drones over the area both before and after the removal of the Drake's Acero gear. Is that the way you see The drone imagery was done by a team. Um, oh, where is Max now? Um, they were both at UC Santa Barbara, and then one of the researchers just recently went to the East Coast, and I want to say University of Virginia. Yeah. Yeah. There was an article in the most recent Bay Nature about surf scoters who, that apparently have declined by like 90% in the Bay Area in the last several decades. And one hypothesis is that it may be related to um, effects on eel of eelgrass, that, that surf scoters feed in eelgrass, mm -hmm. and that there was some suggestion that there have been declines in eelgrass in the Bay. And I wondered if you know anything about the historical changes in eelgrass in the bay and whether that's affecting the birds within san francisco bay yes yeah i'm not i'm not familiar with that that study in particular but i do know that overall across california um since the late 1800s it's hypothesized that eelgrass has decreased by about 70 percent i mean dramatic dramatic de decreases in area a lot of it is driven by um kind of coastal building and infrastructure um, increased sediment and um, decrease water clarity from, from sediment coming into, the, um, into a place like San Francisco Bay or increased nutrients coming into the bay, which can then lead to phytoplankton blooms that block out the light. Um, so it, that, that wouldn't surprise me that if, if you're looking at historical trends of a bird population, you'd see decreases related to, to decreases in eelgrass. Because um, I would imagine that they're feeding on invertebrates that live within this, the eelgrass. Mm. Does that answer your, answer your question? I, I, I don't yeah, actually know the study super well. Um, there's been a lot of um, restoration of marshes, you know, opening up areas, flooding them again. Mm -hmm. um, and they're managing them that sort of for salt marshes and mud flats, is there, is, are they also managing areas for eelgrass? They are, and there's a lot of work trying to understand um, how to manage eelgrass naturally in a way that might increase its population, but then also do physical restoration, so planting new eelgrass shoots or um, uh, adding seed to the environment. Typically, um, it's more successful to plant adult shoots because the seeds can get moved around and um, they only, a lot of times, seagrasses can um, reproduce both vegetatively, so just add new ext clonal extensions off of the main shoot or they can produce, reproduce sexually. And most of the time, they're not reproducing sexually every year. So people tend to think of um, vegetative restoration as a, as a better way to go with planting out adult shoots. Um, seagrasses, though, are notoriously difficult to do restoration on. And a lot of it is due to the importance of site selection. They have all those factors that constrain where they can grow with the light and the waves and getting all those right is really challenging. Um, I, I'm forgetting the exact number, but compared to um, restoration of coral reefs and mangroves, um, there's a p paper comparing restoration efforts and their um, effectiveness, and seagrasses were abysmally low in the percent success for these studies. It was something like, oh, I want to say 30%. I mean, it was just very, very low and very high cost of these restoration efforts. So there's ongoing research trying to understand um, understand how to do restoration more effectively for seagrasses. So your slides showed up at Tamales Bay, 2010, really, really big, mm -hmm. big loop, and then now, 17, pretty small, like half, 50% maybe. Yeah, although, yeah, and they also showed the, what, 2000, I had three different years on there, and I'm blanking on the middle year, but, um, yeah, 20, in 2015, it had de the seagrass bed had decreased dramatically, and that was actually before any installation of aquaculture gear in that area. Um, so it's definitely possible that 
there's interaction, negative interactions with aquaculture gear, something that I you know, want to test as well as looking for positive interactions. But it's also possible that none of these changes we see are due to aquaculture, that they're just due to crazy variability within, um, within the seagrass. And we do know that seagrass beds can be very variable on the year to year or an even season to season scale. Does that kind of address, address your question? But the big picture though, um, it's decreased, but you can't say for sure if the introduction of aquaculture beds right. caused that because they might have been not there when it was already diminishing, right? Right, exactly. And, and in the reason that I, I chose the study design that I did, that Baki design, is so that you have the control site so you can understand how the control site uh, is um, responding just to natural environmental variability while the impact site is also responding to environmental variability, but it has that impact. And in this case, the impact is the addition of aquaculture. People use this type of um, design method when they're looking at maybe the installation of a power plant and they wanna know how that affects, or you know, the building of a large structure and how they wanna know how that affects the ecosystem around it as compared to pristine ecosystem over two miles you know, further down the road or whatever. But you're right, with this, with what we have there, you can't say that it was aquaculture or not aquaculture or the environment. You, you can't really get it understanding the mechanism behind it. So. All right. Well, thank you very much, Sarah. That was really interesting. Thank you.